You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron, live with Ethan Haristadoulou. Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to the Greek's Gridiron. I am Ethan Haristadoulou, and today we are diving into another edition of Divisional Power Rankings, going over the AFC East defenses, ranking them from worst to first. I'll be sharing my thoughts and opinions, so make sure you go ahead, comment down below your power rankings, your thoughts and opinions on my power rankings, and we will begin right now. Starting off with the number four team, we'll work our way up the list here, but at the bottom, this is probably one of the easier ones for me to decide on here, in large part because while I like the group altogether, uh, there's been some injuries that have been dealt, unfortunately, that are going to, I would say, keep this team from reaching quite its full potential until about the midpoint of the season or maybe even a little bit later, and that's going to be the Miami Dolphins, a team that probably could have been a little bit higher on this list had they not lost Jalen Ramsey early on, and we'll get into that in a second, but definitely something that I think might hold this defense back a little bit. Now, when I look at the defensive front of this team here, I do want to see a little bit more from Bradley Chubb. You went and made a big trade for him last season to help push this defense over the top, and you really didn't get a ton of production especially considering what was given up for him with only two and a half sacks, 28 pressures, and seven defensive stops. You throw in a forced fumble in there as well off of 362 snaps. Just not quite the production I think the Dolphins were hoping for bringing in Chubb. So I'm hoping to see a little bit more from him now that he has a complete offseason and more time to really take in what they're doing there defensively. You pair him alongside Jalen Phillips on the opposite side there who's been rock solid since joining the Miami Dolphins the last couple of seasons. And you do have yourself a threat for a pretty strong duo of pass rushers, especially if Jalen Phillips can push closer to more of a premier edge rusher and reach that first round potential that the Dolphins drafted him as. But overall, I do like what they have on the edge. The interior is where things start to get really fun. You, of course, have Christian Wilkins, who in 2022 had nearly 100 tackles. He's able to bring pressure. He's able to bring down the quarterback. He's able to stuff people up in the run. He is one of those top guys on the interior here that feels like a lot of teams, or not teams, excuse me, but people in general don't quite talk about just because the Dolphins defense isn't as noisy as say their offense is so while he's an underappreciated guy do not forget about him absolute stud you pair him with the other interior guys like Raekwon Davis and Zach Sealer and overall you have yourself a really good group that is very well-rounded a group that has guys that can bring down the quarterback that can bring pressure that can also assist in the run I'd say Sealer is more of the pressure guy whereas Raekwon Davis is more of like the run stuffing guy but overall a solid group on the interior to pair along with those edge guys Altogether, I really like them. Uh, Were they the best in this entire list here? No, but a solid group nonetheless. The linebacking corpse is where things get really fun for the Dolphins. You have Jerome Baker, a do-it-all guy. He can literally line up wherever you need him to inside the box. He can drop back. He can bring pressure. He can thump against the run. He literally can do everything that you'd want in an off-ball linebacker on the inside. And then you go inside David Long Jr., who I would say is literally like the same exact thing. Another guy who can drop back in coverage. A guy who can get after the quarterback and bring him down who can stuff people up in the run. You have a excellent duo on the inside with some solid depth with Channing Tindall and Duke Riley behind them. Channing Channing Tindall is one of those guys that I would really like to see a little bit more from him this year. He only ended up playing 10 snaps in 2022. You didn't really get to see a ton of him. I'm hoping that with this next season here, now that he has a full offseason integrated in the system, we get to see more from him. I think he is going to have to see more snaps just based off the way the linebacker room looks. But overall, solid corpse nonetheless. I would say very heavy on the starting side, whereas depth here a little bit just kind of uncertain. And then the secondary, like I said, this is a group that would be a lot more threatening if you were looking at Jalen Ramsey starting week one, but of course it sounds like he's going to miss at least like the first, I would say five, six weeks, maybe even more depending on how long it takes for him to come back from that injury. But I don't think you're seeing him within like the first half of the season at best, like maybe as you're approaching. And even then, probably going to take him a little bit to get back to full speed. So you're not going to get like real Jalen Ramsey until the back half of the season, which is unfortunate because pairing him with Xavier Howard, who is an excellent cornerback one in his own right, who has a penchant for interceptions, would have been a really fun duo to watch trying to shut down some of these AFC offenses that are starting to just get more and more impressive as the years go by, it seems. 
Also, when you look at the cornerback room, you go in and get yourself second round pick out of South Carolina, Cam Smith, 6'1", 180 pounds. You also brought in Eli Abel for depth. There's a lot to like about the secondary. It's just awful that you lose Jalen Ramsey when he was supposed to be a guy that helped push that secondary really over the top there. And then the safety room, I really like this group as well. Brandon Jones, a very versatile safety, a guy who can drop in the box. He can go back deep if you need him to. He can play in the slot as well. And Javon Holland, more of your like over the top safety kind of defense guy. So you have him there. You go and sign Deshaun Elliott as well, who winds up being an excellent third option. And you have yourself a really impressive safety group there as well. So exciting defense. I just need to get more from the pass rush on the edges. And I also need to just kind of see what the depth behind the linebacking group can do, but a really well-rounded group for the most part. In the number three slot here, and I did a lot of juggling between who I was going to have at number three and number two, because I think these two defenses are really close, but I settled on the New England Patriots as my number three defense here. An exciting group up front that could show some improvement this year. Matthew Judon and Josh Uche as the weak side linebackers, like the guys that basically rush off the edge from that opposite uh, from the weak side there. You're looking at 27 sacks, 125 pressures combined altogether in 2022. And I think those numbers might even potentially improve this year as Josh Uche continues to progress further. You already know what Matthew Judon is, but maybe another year in the system can help improve upon his numbers from last year and Uche clearly ascending as a player right now and then on the interior you have guys like Devon Godchow, Lawrence Guy, Christian Barmore, a really group, good group of guys where I really think you get again are going to see even more improvement you know what Godchow and Lawrence are but when it comes to Christian Barmore I think we're going to see an even further leap for him going into year three with another year in Bill Belichick's system Really excited for the defensive front up there because the Patriots were a unit that could be game wreckers up front when it came to their pressure that they could create and the way they were able to stop the run. Then looking at the linebacker corps, this is where I'm not really sold as far as the Patriots defense goes. And this is kind of where it helped me decide over either them or the Buffalo Bills and Jets going forward. The linebacking corps is not super impressive to me. You have Juwan Bentley and Jelani Tavai as your two starting linebackers on the interior there at Mike and Sam respectively but then like the guys behind them you have Marte Mapu out of Sacramento State who was kind of brought in as a versatile linebacker who could play at safety potentially if needed be and then Mac Wilson as well more of like the athletic type of linebacker but not necessarily somebody who put together anything crazy last season for the Patriots I like Juwan Bentley. I think he's a solid guy. Not necessarily sold on Tavai being the guy that starts opposite of him on the inside of that 3-4 defense. And as far as the depth goes, it's not really jumping off the paper for me either as well. This is a group that has a lot to prove to me, in my opinion, and kind of what puts them behind the other two defenses that are left on this list. As for the secondary, this is something that I think we expect to see some improvement on, but is something that I think is worth keeping an eye on because there's a lot of youth involved in this here with some good veteran leadership, but a lot of youth when you look at the Patriots secondary. You bring in first round pick Christian Gonzalez. He's going to be your cornerback one to lead the cornerback room going forward. You have Jack Jones, who's still in a weird legal dispute, but he's out there practicing. He's playing in preseason games, so it seems like he's not going to maybe end up being thrown. I know that there was talk about whether he was going to to see prison time and whatever for the whole gun situation in the airport. I don't know how that's all being resolved right now, but I would assume based off what the Patriots are showing us with his usage so far this preseason, they expect him to be available at least at some point in this season. So we'll see how that shakes out. But Jack Jones was really impressive last season, despite having uh, get, getting himself in a little bit of trouble with Bill Belichick with just how mouthy he could be. But overall, I really liked his game. Jonathan Jones being retained was also massive for this secondary because now with Christian Gonzalez coming in, in, he can move back into the slot, which I think is his best position as a corner. And then the safety room, losing Devin McCourty, obviously a massive loss, but Jalen Mills appears to be taking to the swap to safety really well. Kyle Duggar is also very impressive. Adrian Phillips has been a rock solid guy for this defense the last handful of years. And Jabril Peppers is even finding a good role here as a safety as well. There's a some question marks as to just how far this secondary can go, but I do think the right pieces are in place. It's just a matter of if they can put it all together. And I really like this unit. As far as like weaknesses, like I said, linebacker is the biggest concern for me, but I do trust in Bill Belichick and the defense he puts together year in and year out, hence why I have them etched right over the Miami Dolphins, but still behind two other teams that I think have some more talent on their defensive side of the roster. 
Moving into the number two team now. Again, this is where things get, you know, a little bit more complicated here. We have the Buffalo Bills and the New York Jets remaining. And again, I had some, you know, some thoughts as to who I was going to have at two and who I was going to have at one once I finally settled on my number three team. But ultimately, uh, there's just so much talent in New York. I had a really hard time denying them that first spot. So I settled on the Buffalo Bills as my number two team. Now, Bills fans, hear me out. I understand the potential is there. Losing Von Miller was massive for this defense last year, and I think if you get Von Miller for an entirety of a season rather than just the first half of the season, this defense could look a lot different. On top of that, you also have Tredavious White coming back as well. So you have two really big big players. Like White came in towards like the very back half of the season, and even then, I don't know if you quite got the true Tredavious White. Even further removed from the injury now, getting an offseason of work to really get himself back into where he was prior to his injury and missing the first, like, I forget how many games it was last season, but at least like the first half or so. I think it's really going to benefit this unit. But that's a lot of ifs and buts and needs to have happens type deal. It's not to say that there isn't talent here because outside of Von Miller, defensive front Gregory Russo looked really good while Von Miller was in. I think lost a little bit of gas because he was getting more focus once Von Miller went down. But you did go and add Leonard Floyd from the Rams this past offseason, which I think could help mitigate any injury issues that you have as far as pass rush goes. And the interior is obviously a really exciting group here. You have... Tim Settle and Jordan Phillips, who are backing up a awesome duo in Ed Oliver and Daquan Jones. So interior is, is phenomenal. Not really worried too much about what the Bills can do as far as the defensive line goes. We just need to see a healthy group on the defensive front and more specifically on the edges than anything else. Linebacker group, really good group as well. This is another unit that I really like and that I'm really excited to watch going again into this next season here. Matt Milano playing the weak side linebacker role or basically whatever linebacker role he needs to line up into week in and week out because he can play weak, he can play Mike, whatever you need him to do, he can play it. But he's coming off of a Pro Bowl slash All-Pro season. Now, I am going to be kind of watching how the rest of the room goes, but I think Matt Milano really solidifies this group altogether. But Terrell Bernard at middle linebacker is, or excuse me, Mike linebacker is definitely uh, going to be an interesting interesting watch because he's going to be stepping into a more permanent role on this defense here and you also have like a wild card and third round pick from Tulane Dorian Williams as well you don't necessarily know what kind of role he's going to carve for himself in this unit especially coming in in his first season so there is some question marks as to beyond Matt Milano and just how good this unit can be but you have an all pro Matt Milano who has I've been I think like been very underrated to this point in his career so it was nice to see him finally get the recognition he deserves I'm excited to see how the unit progresses forward if I had to pick like a a weak link to the entire defense probably just the depth of the linebacker room as far as I'm concerned but overall not anything super concerning because you do have a legit all pro guy leading that room there and then as far as the secondary goes like I mentioned earlier Tredavious White coming back Last season late, being able to get some snaps in, you know, and kind of get a feel for things coming off of his big injury was good to see. But I think we're going to get closer to what Tredavious White actually is going at the beginning of this season now that he's had even more time removed from his injury. And on top of that, he got to play some games last year as well. So I think we're going to get a nice boost from Tredavious White over there in Buffalo. Kair Elam did a solid job in his first season, I think, having to take on more of a, an important role than you would have hoped initially out of the gate with Tredavious White taking so long to come back. But now that White's in there, you don't have to put as much pressure on him. You can still allow him to progress, and White's a guy that he could learn from, obviously. But I'm really excited to see how he does. He had a really strong first season as a rookie, four passes defense, a couple of interceptions. Completion percentage was a little high at about 70%, but overall, I think a strong showing in year one for the young man. And then Teron Johnson's going to be handling the slot. The only real issue that he had last year was just he let up seven touchdowns altogether. So if he could improve on that number and get that number a little bit lower. I think you have a really good starting three corners here. And then even the depth behind them with Dane Jackson and Christian Benford, I'm not really too worried about them. And same goes for the safety. Micah Hyde missed pretty much all of last season. And there was a lot of speculation whether Jordan Poyer was going to be around this year as well. You get them to reunite together. And I honestly think that Poyer, Poyer and Micah Hyde together as a unit are probably the best when it comes to sealing off the top part of any defense in the NFL as a safety tandem. They are just like bread and butter. They go together so well, and it's really hard to deny just how good they are. So overall, fantastic group altogether. Minimal weak links. You look at the depth, and that's probably like largest concern as far as any real concern you could pick out of the Buffalo Bills. But 
I do, like I said, have them right behind the New York Jets at number one, and here is why. When you look at the defensive front of the New York Jets, this is where it all starts for them, led by Quinnen Williams, who is arguably the top interior defensive tackle you could have in the NFL right now. Only other person you probably put ahead of him is like Aaron Donald, but... As far as quarterback knockdowns were concerned, they were number one in the NFL at 3.7% of dropbacks knocking down the cornerback. And then they had the third highest pressure rate at 25.4%. So every four snaps, you are pressuring the quarterback and making things difficult for them. No matter who it is that you're going up against, this defensive front was an absolute problem to deal with for offensive lines last year. You look at the depth around the interior of the D-line as well. You go and you bring in Al Woods, who I think is going to be a solid addition to this unit. You have, on top of that, Solomon Thomas, reliable as any interior guy. And then there's also Quinton Jefferson as well. This is a loaded interior. And this is not, and I haven't even gotten to talking about the edge rushers on this defense as well. One of the best groups I think the NFL has altogether from like top to bottom. You look at your starters in Carl Lawson and John Franklin Myers, not necessarily household names, but guys that are effective and benefit from having such a strong group on the interior to collapse the pocket from the inside. They can take advantage of mismatches because you have to put so much attention on what the interior is doing. But then behind those guys as well, you're looking at first round pick Will McDonald, the fourth from this year's draft class. You have Jermaine Johnson from last year's draft class. You have Michael Clemens, who looked solid in some action as well. This is a very strong and also deep front seven. And I would argue probably the best in the NFL right now from top to bottom. When you look at your starters all the way to the guys that are going to fill out the rest of that depth chart once your 53-man roster cuts happen, this is a group that I would put up against pretty much anyone else in the NFL. The only other one that I think might have a strong argument like this group here is honestly like Seattle. Seattle would be another team that's close, but I do think that the Jets sit at the top of the mountain when it comes to just the defensive front from literally top to bottom. Linebacking Corps is also a really good group as well. You have CJ Mosley now, back-to-back really strong seasons. I know we got a lot of flack for being hurt that first year in New York, but overall the last couple of seasons, coming off of a second-team All-Pro year for him, he has 326 total tackles. And then you have Quincy Williams, who in the last two seasons as well, since joining the New York Jets, has 216 himself. You have two guys that are just tackling machines that know how to get to the quarter, whether it's the quarterback or get to the football in general, whatever it may be. These are two studs on the interior of this defense here. And then you have guys like Nick Vigil, who you brought in for depth this offseason, also drafting sixth round pick out of Western Michigan, Zaire Barnes. There is a lot to like about this unit. There is a question mark, in my opinion, as far as what the weak side linebacker is going to look like for the Jets this year. But altogether, again, another solid, strong starting duo, and then guys of depth behind him, another excellent unit. And then you get into the secondary. This is where... Things get serious for this Jets team. Again, the defensive front is unbelievable, but the secondary is just turning into an absolute monster of its own. Defensive rookie of the year from last season, Sauce Gardner, is legit as they come as far as cornerbacks are concerned in the NFL. 20 passes defense last season, two interceptions, a completion percentage of 53.5%. Rating as well, going his direction for quarterbacks was at 62.7. I mean, the guy was an absolute menace, and it was his first season in the NFL. He was a problem for people to deal with, and he was just a rookie. Imagine how he does as he continues to progress. Then you look at the rest of the secondary as well. DJ Reed, opposite of him, is a ball hawk himself, a playmaker. He can get things done. He had an interception with a 63.5% completion percentage last year. Not worried about what's going on opposite of Sauce Gardner. Michael Carter has even started to evolve himself into a really good slot corner for this defense as well. Another strong season last year with about a 65% completion percentage going his way. He came away with a couple of picks as well. He's somebody who does an excellent job dealing with those inside routes. And then like safety is probably where you might find a little bit of a weak point here because you don't necessarily know what's going on as far as opposite of Jordan Whitehead. He's coming off a career year high in 89 with 89 tackles. He had a couple of interceptions, a career low completion percentage going his way as well just under 55 percent excellent player there and then opposite of him do you get adrian amos starting bringing in from uh, bringing him in from green bay or do you maybe go with tony adams somebody who's been on the roster that seems like something that's going to have to work itself out but aside from that 
there's really not a lot to dislike. And this defense, and this is the thing that really I need to hammer home, is that this defense was so good last year, despite the offensive inefficiency that they dealt with. Imagine how much better this defense is actually going to be when their offense is moving the football consistently, getting them off the field more, or just keeping them off the field more, not getting them off the field more, excuse me, but keeping them off the field more than they were last year. An even healthier, less exhausted unit could be very threatening against a lot of these high-powered AFC offenses we're seeing right now. But that's how I look at the AFC East defenses. Again, let me hear your thoughts and opinions on the AFC defenses. Let me hear about my power rankings. What are your thoughts and opinions on those? Feel free to agree or disagree in the comment section down below. But that is it for me. I appreciate you if you made it to the end of the video. I will see you all next time. Have a good one.